The book of Daniel is an ancient story with modern implications. A group of teenagers were exiled to a foreign culture, ripped from a life they had always known. In the shadow of Babylon, they learned it is possible to speak the language of a culture, yet still worship God. Thousands of years later, their story is now our story, bringing glory to God, thriving despite darkness. We are the Outsiders. that we have here a great start to uh, the fall season even though it's not technically fall yet and it's of course exciting for me because it's kickoff Sunday for the NFL and that's like <laughs> awesome so if you need to reach me this afternoon leave a voice message no I'm joking <laughs> um, I'm very very excited about this sermon series um, I, I, I get excited about almost every series as you might imagine because that's the way I, I go but I really am excited about this one because I think it's very timely, very needed uh, in our culture. In fact, this sermon series that we're in, which is Lessons on Thriving in Babylon from Daniel, from the book of Daniel, was not originally on our sermon calendar for this year. We had talked about doing a series like this, but it wasn't on the calendar. But then I just began to be very convicted about what I was seeing happen in our culture and how Christianity was kind of being marginalized and Christians were pushed to the side and, and to see some of their responses to that back and back and forth and all this. And I just really thought, wow, this is, this is really a, a different time and we need to address it. I mean, let's face it, we, we use a lot of the language in this series that we're not the home team anymore. Used to, in Christianity, the church was kind of, in the world, the church was kind of the home team. In other words, even though somebody may not have attended the church or been a member of the church, they were still excited about uh, uh, the things that the church did. They respected the church. Uh, they respected people who went to church. But slowly but surely, we've seen this cultural shift, and some of it obviously our fault, and, and a lot of it just the way of the world. And what we've seen is this cultural shift where we're now the visiting team. And what happens when a visiting team goes on the road? They get booed. They get harassed. They get things thrown at them. They get uh, really, they're the villains and they're, they're the hated ones or despised ones. And what I see is there's a lot of our culture looking at the church. And if you're here and you're checking us out and you're not a Christian, you, you might understand some of those feelings. You might have had them yourself. Uh, and just look at the church as, as the enemy. And that's not good. And so we really felt, I just, I went to Drew and I said, Drew, we, we got to change our sermon count. And we've got to talk about this new reality that we live in. He said, man, I, I'm with you on it, and, and I think doing it through Daniel would be a great way to go because um, uh, and, and, uh, we, we're in Babylon now, and, and we've got to learn how to live in Babylon. And I was like, that's a great idea. And so we sit down and we rework the whole last part of the year uh, to focus on this, and we think it's really, really crucial and important because we think that what we see here is the church's reaction to this marginalization, to this hostility in three different ways that is not biblical nor healthy. The first way that we see the church reacting is to be withdrawn from culture. I mean, we see the church say, well, the world's going to hell, and so we're just, we don't want to be a part of it, and so we're just going to have our own culture, or we're going to have our own uh, books and music, and, and not saying that's wrong in and of itself, or we're going to have our own schools, or we're going to pull out of our society. And I'm telling you, when the church pulls out of everyday culture, bad things happen. And so that's not a good approach. Jesus said to be the salt and the light. So that's one response. Another response we see the world doing, though, is they attack culture. Let's go back at them. Let's win this battle. And they get more caught up in winning battles and, and their own rights than they are being righteous. And the Bible says they will know we are Christians not by our bumper sticker, <laughs> not by our, how right we are. It says we'll know we are Christians by our what? Love. Our love. And so 
That's not good. There's a third response, though, that, that I see some in the world doing, or in the church doing. Let's just blend in. Let's just become like, let's just accept what they accept is right, and let's just live like they live, and just say, hey, we're all sinners anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And that's not appropriate either, because the Bible says we're not to conform to the patterns of this word, but, but we're to be transformed. And I think by being transformed, we become transforming. And that's important. So how do we do that? What's the right response? Well, I think we learn a little bit from Daniel. And we're going to look at the first chapter of Daniel today. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, Daniel chapter uh, 1. If you have a Bible or an app, if you don't have uh, that with you, grab one from the chair in front of you or around you or up in the tables up top. Turn it to page 522. We're going to cover most of the chapter. We won't read every verse necessarily. I'm going to tell you the story of the first seven verses for time's sake, and then we'll start reading after that. And um, so I'm going to bring you up to date. Drew kicked off this sermon series last week talking about our new reality. It was a powerful, powerful message. And it gave so much historical background to what we're going to be talking about in this series that this is one of those times where I'm going to just insist, if at all possible, if you were gone, it was a holiday weekend, a lot of people were gone. If you were gone, go back and watch or listen to that message sermon ser er, message last week because it really gives you a foundation for the time, the history, and what was going on. And we learned that we played a big part in why we're in this new Babylon, why we're in this exile from the homeland. And we played a big part in it as, as believers and, and that it's not the end. It's just the beginning. And God's going to use even this time to redeem for His glory because that's what he does, and that's, that's what he's a master of. And so go back and read that. Also, if, you have a, if you're in a community group or you're wanting to start a community group, this, the studies that, that Richard is designing for this series are just fantastic. I want, you to, I want you to use them. They are that crucial, that important. It's good stuff. So let me just bring you up to date to where we're at in the first part of this chapter. Daniel and his friend Hananiah, uh, Michelle, and Azariah, they were among the young men in the people of Jerusalem. When the Babylonian Empire came and seized Jerusalem. Now, what we discover is there was actually three different attacks. One of them where they took over completely. This is the first one. And what they did in this one is the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, said, here's what I want you to do. When he seized Jerusalem, he says, I want some of their best and their brightest for my work. For my, in the royal court, I want them there. So you take them out of their home, rip them away from their families, you bring them back to Babylon. And so Daniel and his friends were some of those who got pulled out. They were from nobility or they were from the royal family. Uh, they had some type, and they were uh, talented, gifted, good-looking, bright teenagers. Probably between the ages of 14 and 17, uh, I, I, most scholars would say. And can you just imagine for a moment getting ripped from everything you knew to a place where there's a new language, a new way of life, and no one you know hardly there at all. And this is what happened. And so he rips them out of their culture. He takes them to their capital, their culture, and he teaches them, makes them learn, has them learn everything Babylonian, all their culture, their history, their philosophies. They are really getting educated in the way of the Babylonian empire. And not only that, he is going to change their names because he really wants to give them a new identity. So Nebuchadnezzar orders that their name be changed to Babylonian names. And there's real significance in Hebrew names, if you, if you don't know that, the Jewish people's names. Like, for example, Daniel's name meant, God is my judge. And they changed it to Belshazzar, which is, Bel will protect. Hananiah's name meant, God is gracious, but they changed it to Shadrach inspiration of the sons. Michelle's Hebrew name means God is without equal, and they changed it to Meshach, which means belong, belonging to Aku, which is a false god. Azariah's name means the Lord is my helper, and they changed it to Abednego, which means servant of Nego, which again is a false god, a false prophet. So Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar changed their location, he changed their education, their culture, and then he changed their name. And then he ordered that they change their diet to eat only what his servants eat. And this is where you're going to see and you're going to learn that Daniel stood firm. He stood firm 
And we're going to learn from Daniel's story today how to cooperate without compromising. And it begins like this. If you want to cooperate without compromising, you've got to be determined to stand firm on the important things. Stand firm on what's important. That's what Daniel said. He said he was going to stand firm on this. He was not going to change on this. He had made up his mind, the Bible says. He had decided in advance. Verse 8 says, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself, eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now stop right there. He said, listen, you can take me from my home. I'm not even going to fight you on that. You can teach me whatever you want to teach me. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to redeem it for good. You can change my name because I'm not defined by what people call me. I'm defined by who I am. You can change my name and call me whatever you like. But I cannot eat the food that my God commands me not to eat. I cannot defile myself and turn my back on the one who's been so good to me, who is the God Almighty, who is the one who provides, who is the one who takes care of me no matter what. He had the kind of trust and relationship with God that he says, I am going to draw a line in the sand. In fact, the word here that he determined is a word that uh, could be best translated resolve, and it's as if he's taking a stake and putting it down and saying, this is my property, this is my territory, we will not cross it, and you will not cross it. He's putting up a boundary here and saying, this is where I stand, and you can change my name, you can change where I live, you can change what you teach me, but you will not cause me to turn my back on what God says matters most. He was determined to put up boundaries. And as Christians in our life, there are some times where we need to be determined ourselves to say, I am going to stand on the truth of God's Word in my life. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, with all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you in person, both in person and by letter. He says, stand firm. The apostle Peter is writing to a church in, in, in First Peter that is persecuted, beat down. They're facing their own Babylonian invasion, only it's called Rome. And he says, listen, you stand firm with the truth. And we got to do the same. We got to do more than just be churchgoers. We got to do more than just be Christians and just believe. You know, belief is accepting it with your head, but conviction, conviction is a demonstration of that belief. And I want to tell you, you might argue about your belief, but a conviction is something you would die for. You resolve to say, God, for better, for worse, for death or life, I'm going to stand here for you. And Daniel did that. And we need to. And I want you to know, it's easier, not easy, easier to stand firm on the thus saith the Lord's, right? Where we have commands in Scripture to follow them, it's a little easier. Now, it's not always comfortable because we've got to talk to our lost friends about our beliefs, and, and some of those are uncomfortable, and, and we don't, but we, we can do that. When, it's, when there's a thus saith the Lord, when there's a command in Scripture, it's a lot easier for me to stand firm. What's hard for me to do is to put up boundaries that come from God speaking to me through his word. You know, there's some areas where you've got to put up boundaries that are not thus said the Lord's, but you just know deep in your heart as you study scripture and as you know yourself and as the Holy Spirit reveals itself in you that you can't go there. You can't do that. For example, for some of you, you may need to stand firm on the truth of God. You may need to put up boundaries and say, I can't go to that place. It's just not a place where I'm going to glorify God. My witness is not going to be enhanced there. For some of you, it can be, I just can't play that game anymore. Every time I hit the ball out of bounds, it causes me to be bad. <laughs> For some of you, it may be, I, I just got to stay away from that person and not be around them. I got to break off that relationship, not because I don't love them, but because I know no matter how much my good intentions are, when I am with them, I am going down a path that does not glorify God and does not enhance my witness. It does not make me go closer to God. It makes me go farther away. For some of you, maybe your boundary is what you're putting in your head. Maybe you're going to have to 
change or moderate the entertainment, the music, the movies, the, what you read, the television, because you know it's affecting you. Maybe for some of you, it's, you know, you've got to stay away from alcohol because you just know that you, you're, you're a person that will abuse it. You can't drink in moderation. And it's not helping your witness. For some of you, it may be to get rid of the internet or put some kind of filter on your internet because you just can't stop. It's an addiction. It's got a hold of you. That, that, that images you're looking at and it's destroying your marriage or your life. It's certainly not helping your walk with God. For some of you, it may be something as innocent as a smartphone. You can't even have a relationship or a conversation with those you have a relationship with. You can't sit around the dinner table without checking to see if somebody liked your post. And maybe you need to get rid of it or moderate it or put it away at certain times in your life. I don't know what boundaries you need to put up, but all of us have things that we need, some guide rails we need to put in our life to say, God, this is not drawing me to you. This is not helping me be the servant you want me to be. So I'm going to put a stake in the ground. I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say, as for me, I will not go there. And so boundaries and this new reality are important. I think they're hard, too. You know, sometimes boundaries are hard when we're, or when we're facing tough times, but I think it's even harder when we're being blessed. You know, this Babylonian place that Daniel's taken to, can you think about it from a positive perspective? Yeah, they got ripped away from their home. Yeah, life was different, but they got the best thing that that world had to offer to them. The best education, probably the best entertainment, probably the best, they certainly could have had what was considered the best food of the day. I mean, who could have possibly faulted them after all they'd been ripped away from if they'd just ate a little of that food? And I want you to know, friends, we have the biggest Babylonian culture in the world. We're given the best of everything from, from money to education to freedom to electronics to to technology. We, we have it all, right? But sometimes Babylonian will bless you so that it can steal your soul. And I want to tell you, sometimes you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, as good as it is, I've got to stop and follow God. <coughs> Daniel stood firm. And I want to ask you something. What have you given up or sacrificed in Babylon that's cost you anything lately? Daniel took a chance and he stood firm. And he stood firm on what mattered most. Do you, do you get that? I mean, Hebrew names were a big deal, but he didn't fight them on the names. He didn't say, this is where I'm drawing the line. You're not calling me by that name. He didn't even fight them, go kicking, dragging, screaming all the way to Babylon. What he said is, I'm going to stand for what matters most. And I see sometimes Christians in this world where culture is invading and corrupting and messing with us. And what the result is, sometimes we just want to pick and fight every single battle and die on every single hill and go to every rally to fight for our rights. And sometimes in an effort to fight for our rights, we are not righteous and we are not a good witness for God. And we need to step back and say, we don't have to die on every hill. There are things that the world pushes that doesn't matter. There are battles I'm not going to fight. Guess what? I don't care whether the clerk at the store tells me happy holidays or Merry Christmas. <laughs> doesn't matter. I'm not expecting the world to act like the church. Why would the Babylonians live like the Israelites? And so we got to understand, we don't have to fight every single battle, every single thing that this world fights us. We need to stand for what matters, and mostly stand for what matters in our life. You notice Daniel wasn't going around t telling the Babylonians they had to live out his personal conviction. You shouldn't be eating that food. It's wrong. No. He stood for it himself. And so church, it's not our job to go curse the darkness. It's our job to be reflections of the light of Jesus Christ and stand firm on what matters. Jesus said in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. 
But it didn't stop there. Also, I believe that we, we can truly, truly cooperate without compromising by standing with gentleness and respect. Daniel stood with a gentleness and respect. It was really a different type of approach than what you would think he might have taken. Verse 8, again, says, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to him by the king. But look at this next part. He asked the chief of staff permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Ask permission? He didn't demand. He didn't yell. He didn't say, no way, I'm going on a hunger strike. He said, can you please not make us eat those foods? He did it with this kind of gentleness and respect that so many in our world have a hard time doing. We are told in the Bible that we are to love others and, we're, and with gentleness and respect and, 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 and that they'll know we are Christians by our love, but too often we think that they will know we are Christians by us being right or by us winning some kind of battle. But look at the way he approaches this. He's not fighting culture in political rallies. He's not fighting culture by, by shouting down the world. He's not fighting culture in the ways that, that, that making sarcastic posts on the Internet about this and that and the other. He's fighting the battle, standing firm with this gentleness and this respect. And it's amazing to see how God blesses that. The fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. I'm going to go from preaching to meddling. When I see a lot of the social media posts that Christians are making today, they are not love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And I cringe at some of the responses that I see when Christians go on this attack as if it's, as if it's us versus them instead of us versus Satan. They're not the enemy. The world is prisoners of the enemy. And sometimes the only thing they see is that Christians don't like them, what they're against. I have a friend I serve on a committee with in the North American Christian Convention. His name's Caleb Kottenbach. And Caleb is an interesting young man. He preaches at a large church in Southern California, Discover Christian Church, and he has an interesting story. He was uh, a child to a mother and a father who was university professors. They hadn't been married very long when they had Caleb. When Caleb was two years old, they divorced, which is not super uncommon, unfortunately, but it was quite unusual because Caleb's mom fell in love with another woman and his dad fell in love with another man. Caleb lived the most early part of his life by hanging out with his mom and her uh, girlfriend, and they would go to clubs, uh, gay clubs, and Caleb was just around that. They were marching in a gay pri pride parade when Caleb was nine years old, and somebody came up and threw, shouting at him, threw urine on them. And when Caleb asked his mom why someone would do that, she said, well, he's a Christian, and they hate people. And I think much of the world experiences that. We know it's not the truth of the majority of Christians, but it's the message that's portrayed. Thankfully, Caleb went to this Bible study as a teenager where he went to try to disprove Christianity. And he found grace and love, and he became a Christian. And he's now a great preacher. And not only that, he's witnessing to people who are very different. He's got a book coming out in October called messy grace that talks about how to both stand firm on the truth of scripture what it says about sexual sins but also love them with the grace of jesus and i'm really excited i'm gonna try to interview him for a series we have coming up but i i, I say all that to say that what message are we portraying there's an old saying that i learned at church camp when i was little you're the only jesus some people will ever see you're the only bible some people will ever read what kind of Jesus are they seeing? What kind of Bible 
are they re reading? Stand firm, but do it with gentleness and respect. Thirdly, though, we can cooperate without compromise by being willing to rely on God's help. Be willing to rely on God's help. You don't have to do this in your power. We have a God who is greater than all of this world. It is his battle to start with, and we got to start trusting and relying on him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you need to stand for, but I know that God is greater than that. He is greater. He is greater than anything, and you got to trust him. Look at what happens here in verse 9. It says, now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Who gave him that? God gave him that. God gave him this affection. The God who is in control, who has dominion over all kingdoms, even Babylonia, has dominion over all things. He gave this jailer, this chief of staff, this, this great admiration for Daniel in a way that's going to be receptive for what Daniel is going to say next. We need to stop relying on our own power. Jesus told his disciples, he said, listen, when you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it is not you who will be speaking. It is the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. We can have that same promise, that, that, that when we're challenged, we come up against, we just trust God and, and don't speak first, but listen and just let Him speak through you. I, I think the problem is we're not relying on God's power in this battle for our culture. We're relying on the kingdom of the world. So many people are trying to fight it through politics and through uh, media and through all of those things. And I'm not saying that you should, we live in a country where we're free. We should speak our mind. We should talk to our representatives. We should vote our conscience. Paul used his right as a Roman citizen for the ministry at some point. So I'm not saying disregard all that, but I'm saying that's not the way you win the battle. I have a friend who's going through a, a marriage problems and he calls me and gets advice and I say, you just got to understand something. No matter how much you think she is the enemy right now, you got to understand this battle's not won on this realm. You got to be praying. You got to be being faithful to God and listening to him to speak to you because the Bible says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly realms. You see, we got to stand firm, but don't try to do it on our own paddle. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we have a friend in Jesus that is by our side and with us, and he is the power, he is the strength through which we can do all things, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Fourthly, I see, though, that if we're going to do this, we've got to be resourceful and persistent. We don't just rely on God's power. He's also given us other gifts and other opportunities to redeem for his purposes. Listen to what Daniel does here. It's really cool. He persisted, and he did so with a creativity that I just love. Beginning in verse 10. But he responded, uh, this is talking about the, the, the chief of staff. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths i'm afraid the king will have me beheaded <laughs> understand something here we learn in, a, in 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 the scripture other translations that these these uh, chief guards this chief they're eunuchs right they've already had something taken from them by the king okay and now he's thinking there's going to be something far worse taken from me he's going to take my head and so he said i, I don't want to do that so he goes on to say uh, Daniel says, spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff, and he said, look, after Daniel, Hananiah, Mich Michelle, and Azariah, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested it, them for 10 days. Isn't that awesome? Daniel says, wait, 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 wait. It's just not just that I'm not going to do that. Let, let me help you help me here. Ten days won't matter. Just watch for ten days as we eat the foods that our God has told us to eat. And, and they eat what you're giving them and see which one works out. And as you go on and read, and, and I won't read it all, but at the end of the ten days, Daniel and his men looked better. He looked better. Now, why do I say all that? I say that Daniel did something very interesting here. 
He was very persistent, but he was very resourceful and creative in redeeming what was around him. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that he ate up everything that, that they taught him. It said in verse 17 that God gave these four young men an unusual appetite for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel a special ability to interpret the meaning and visions of dreams. What is happening here is Daniel is using everything at his disposal to redeem it, to use for God's purposes. It's as if what Jesus says years later is on deep on Daniel's heart when Jesus says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snake and as harmless as does. Be, be, as, be as on guard and watchful in the way you approach as a snake is after its prey. But be as harmless as a dove. That's the way he told his disciples to go out and win the world. And that's the way Daniel approached this. And so many other things as we learn as he stands in prayer, as they stand and not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, as all those things that we're going to read about, and we're going to talk a lot about persecution next week. As you read all that, he constantly trusted God, but also was very resourceful and persistent. Daniel actually redeemed and embraced the new culture in order to redeem it for God's purposes. Let's not take the fight or flight approach, church. What's the fight approach? I already talked about it. Fighting our culture with the battle, with the weapons of this world. What's the flight approach? Let's separate. Let's pull out a culture. We actually tried that. It's not working out so well. Let's instead, when everything that doesn't go against God, let's redeem it for good and use it. Now, that's why we do what we do here. The sounds that we do, the music that we do, the approach, the using video, it's because we are speaking a medium, a language that is neither pro-God or anti-God, and we're using it for God to get people to hear the gospel message, which is powerful and will touch their hearts. And, and it's why we do a lot of things. You know, a lot of times we're, we, we put one of the, the praise bands, one of the bands in the, in the, the parade here at the Strassenfest, and most of those years we pick some type of a secular song that also can be redeemed for spiritual meanings. And we you do that on the float as it's going around the parade because it catches people's ears and they listen more and then they'll get to the heart of the message. <laughs> a few years ago, we did one of those Spirit in the Sky uh, songs and Mark Messmore, our associate minister, uh, reminded me of this this week, uh, former associate minister, he's in Troy, Ohio now, but he said as we were singing that song, some lady come running up to him, stop that from singing that! That song's talking about Indian spirits even though it does say we have a friend in Jesus. And Mark just ignored her. But you see, we were redeeming something that a lot of people wouldn't have liked. But we were doing it to reach people. We, we often say around here, we'll do everything short of sinning to get people to God because their eternity depends on finding Jesus. So that's what Daniel was doing. Finally, after all that, though, I see that we must be willing to trust God with all the results. Trust God with the results. We don't have to do all the work. We don't have to win this battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. I've said that a couple of times. We've sang it. It's the important thing for you to wrap your mind around. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going for. But the battle belongs to the Lord. Listen to what happened here. Verse 14. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested him for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided by the others. So Daniel trusted God in this plan. He followed God in this plan. He did it, and God took care of the results. And David and his friends Three friends were healthier than all the other, and they were allowed to keep their convictions. And we read at the end of the chapter, verse 18, that King Nebuchadnezzar was amazed, and he was amazed more and more by these three guys, and, and, and the king consulted them because he was amazed with their wisdom because what did they do? They embraced their culture. They studied the literature. They knew a lot more. They really, uh, it says they were able to do more than the magicians and chanters of his kingdom. And then verse 21 says, Daniel remained in royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. For many, many years here, amazing stuff happened because Daniel trusted God. He trusted God. Church, we've got to trust God. 
You are not going to win this world through the, only the means of this world. You've got to trust God. Give Him what you have and allow Him to transform it. We're going to see Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do this time and time again. And God will do it for you. God will take your hurt. I was with a family on end of this week that goes is going through one of the worst hurts I can ever imagine. And God could take their hurt and he can redeem it and he can use it for their good and his glory. God could take your trials and he can turn it into his triumphs. God can take your mess ups and he can turn it into your testimony for him. And he can take Satan's biggest attack. And he can take what Satan intended for bad and use it for good. And I'd love to share two or three stories of him doing that today. But for time's sake, I'm just going to bring you to one. When Jesus was arrested and crucified, Satan thought he had won the battle. He intended it for harm. What if I take their Messiah? What if I take God's Son, God in the flesh? What if I take it and I get him to be put to death? But what Satan intended for bad, God used for good. In fact, Jesus wasn't forced to do it at all. He laid down his life willingly because he knew that you and I couldn't save ourselves. You see, I am a sinner. You are a sinner. And my sin and your sin, it doesn't matter how many, one separates us from God. And so I'm no better than you are. And you're no better than I am. All of us are equal at the foot of the cross. We can't pay for our sins. We can't save ourselves. Satan thought he had won. But Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. When he broke his body, he shed his blood. And gave us forgiveness. And then he overcame death and rose again and gave us victory forever. Folks, trust God. We think it's so important to remember that, that we remind ourselves of how much we have to trust him for our salvation every week through something we call communion. And this is a time in our worship service where we remember the sacrifice of Jesus that he broke his body and he shed his blood in our place. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song about the friend we have in Jesus. And as that song's passed, we're going to pass a tray. Our ushers will pass a tray. On the tray, there's two cups in each slot and the bottom one has a piece of bread. What is that bread about? It's to remind us of the broken body of Jesus Christ. On the top cup, there's juice and it reminds us of the blood that washes away our sin and we take it and we remember the sacrifice they, that he did for us and listen as you're thanking God and as you're worshiping him for what he's done and you're celebrating that what Satan intended for bad God used for good you can take that communion as it's passed or you can wait till the end of the song when it's just you and God and you can take it then but we invite you if you are a Christian if you're a follower of Christ to take communion and for those of you who have not accepted that, Jesus gave up so much to pay you for your forgiveness, to buy you back from Satan, the enemy. You don't have to be a prisoner of war anymore. And we'll give you an opportunity to do something about that as well. Let's pray and commune together. Father God, we thank you for this common union. We all stand united. No matter what our background, no matter what we've done, no matter what we look like, no matter our family heritage, no matter what our name is, no matter any of that, it doesn't matter because we're united under one thing, and that's you. It's a common union with you, bought, made us brothers and sisters in Christ through your blood. And so may we remember the sacrifice, and may we rejoice in that sacrifice. And may it motivate us to stand with you all the days of our lives. Through your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. If 
everyone around the world hear the joyful sound see the heavens open up and music coming down nothing's gonna separate us from the father's love i can't help but celebrate cause we're not alone god is on our side we can't be against us god is on our side we won't be afraid for the mountains may fall and the sky To the riverside, wash it all away. And leave behind your troubled mind for an uncloudy day. And nothing's gonna separate us from the Father's love. I can't help but celebrate, cause we're not alone. God is on our side. Who can be against us? God is on our side. We won't be afraid, though the mountains may fall and the sky. Crumble, there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. church. We're on the mission field. Go and share Jesus' love this week.